Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position 10 degrees 20 minutes north, 107 degrees 45 minutes east. Sky fair, wind fresh. Remarks, departed Barria after losing two passengers. Reason for loss, the green tourist and the temple bell. The port of Barilla swelters 10 degrees above the equator on the southern coast of the leg of land that holds French Indochina. An hour spent there is too long, but I've known unscheduled ships like the Scarlet Queen to lay there for months before a cargo materialized out of the dilapidated warehouses that fringe the muddy, unkempt harbor. But due to our connection with the China traders, we were there only three days before we started loading a cargo of supplies for our company's trading station in Port Moresby, New Guinea. And not two hours after the whine of our winches and the swing of our cargo boom started to tell the harbor that we'd be headed out soon, two Americans arrived to buy passage across the China Sea to British North Borneo. Uh, Captain Carney? Yeah. My name is Matthias, Captain. Edmund Matthias. Oh, yeah. China Trader's office told us to expect you, sir. And this is my son, Stanley. Oh, glad to know you, Stan. Well, thanks, Captain. Mighty happy to be aboard. They were easy people to know. By nightfall, when we were loaded and only waiting for the dawn tide to sail, we were sharing our laughs and hopes with them and had learned that theirs was a journey of leisure after years in Nevada spent dreaming about the wonders and glory of the Orient. I was in my cabin that evening making a final check of my bills of lading, and my chief mate Gallagher had taken Stan and his father up into town for a final drink. I'd got to the end of my lists and was halfway into a fresh jumper when I heard feet hit the gangway and then the deck. Gallagher, what's the matter? It's a kid, Stan. He didn't show right, up. Take it easy. Show up where? He took a powder on the way up. Said he'd meet us at a bar at eight. Yeah, what's well, ten now? We just got word that he was wandering into the native section on the waterfront all by himself. His old man's going nuts. Where is the old man? Waiting for us in the bar. We'd better get back up there, Skipper. Berea's no place for a green kid like Stan. Yeah, break out a couple of 45s, Red. We'll go look for him. <laughs> And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Side table. Yeah. He looks like he's going to need some taken care of himself. Uh, Captain Carney, thank heaven you've come. Yeah, it'll be all right now, Mr. Oh, there are so many things that could have happened. He isn't used to things like this back in Nevada. He wouldn't be gone this long if something weren't yeah, wrong. Well, we'll find him, Mr. Mellon. Well, the first thing you've got to do is stop your imagination. I only wish it were imagination, but I know my son. He promised to meet us here over two hours ago, and he hasn't arrived yet. I know that nothing but an accident, or... I know that nothing would detain Stan if he could help it. What shall I do, Captain? What shall I do? Now, first try to calm down. I'm sorry, but you must know how I feel. Oh, sure I do. Now, who told you that they'd seen Stan, and what kind of a line did they give you on it? Oh, it was one of the natives that worked at the hotel. Uh -huh. He said he'd seen Stan at the end of Vejraburi, the street where the native bars are, and the gambling dens, and I don't know what else... He said Stan joined the crowd of men gathered in front of the Temple of the Apsaraces. That was more than an hour before he was to meet us here. What is this Temple of the Apsaraces, do you know? Uh, well, it belongs to a cult, I believe, rather than a recognized religion. Beyond that, I know nothing. Captain, if I have allowed anything to happen to my son, I, I don't know what I'd say. I don't know what I'd do. Okay, okay, Mr. Mazzias. Take him back to the ship, Red. No, no, Captain Carney. I can't sit there and do nothing. With that calamity approach of yours, you aren't doing any good here. But, Captain... Never mind. You got the obituary all written. If he does have to be in trouble, it doesn't have to be any worse than being stiff from too big a load of native grog. Now, 
Go on with Red and stay aboard. I'll see you later. Well, I was thinking that I ought to stick with you, Skipper. Two's better than one, well, you I'm not know, going but... alone, Red. I'm going up to the China Trader's office and check with Lin Ti Shen. Okay. He's been in Berea long enough to know every corner in it. All right, huh? The po- Oh, my visitor is you, Captain Carney. Now, I'm sorry to bother you at this time of night, Ling Tichin. One time is like the other. There's no bother. One of my passengers is missing, the young one, Stanley Mathias. Went to Bejra Buri Street. He could be happy on that street, but since he is accidental, only briefly, I think. Oh, well, I'm going down to look for him. It would be my honor to go with you. Oh, thanks, Ling. Oh, incidentally, he was seen by a native in front of the Temple of the Apsaraces. Then, Captain, it is my misfortune to tell you that... Your concern is well-founded. It is a place of evil, asking the benevolent forgiveness of my ancestors. We will go there that you may see. Bejra Buri was an uncomfortable, jumbled street, lined by crowded buildings hiding their interiors behind shattered windows and curtained doors. Mixed with the reek of its humanity was the stench of the harbor along which it stretched, and into which went its refuse, including some of the men who came there and were never seen again. It was an ugly street. So ugly that the beauty of the temple at the end of it was a shock. Orange flame flickered from two massive female statues. The temple of the Apsaraces gave the immediate impression of evil and yet beauty. The columns that supported the roof were more massive female figures. The carvings on the heavy doors that guarded the unseen interior carried out the same theme. And before this door, a woman danced. Behind her stood three more, swaying slowly back and forth, one of them chanting, the other two adding the music of native instruments. Ling Ti Chen and I stood for a while at the edge of a scattered crowd of silence almost hypnotized native men. Then he pulled me back into the shadows. You have been cursed, Captain, by viewing the temple of Apsaraces. It is the renewal in the form of a cult of an ancient legend that is told in the stone carvings on the temples of Prahan. What's behind it? What does it mean? The legend tells that the Apsaraces were creatures of great beauty half human, half deity, who are sent by the gods to lead astray those mortals whose lives were without sin, and so prevent overcrowding in heaven. Mm-hmm. This audience tonight doesn't seem so saintly. Or aren't the creatures so particular these days? I know only this. Many strangers to Baria have entered the temple and have not returned. But I have not before heard of an Occidental whose mind was ready to receive the message of the Apsaraces. You wait here, Captain. I will find one of the watchers to speak with him. Perhaps learn more. Ling Ti Chen joined the entranced crowd. I was left alone. Listening to the monotonous chant. Watching the monotonous gyrations of the dancer. The atmosphere was something between a dream and actuality. It didn't make sense, but there I was. Faced by the ceremony. For a moment, it didn't seem too strange that young Stan Matthias might have been caught and drawn in him. I didn't realize that Ling Ti Chen was back until he tapped me on the shoulder. Captain? <laughs> oh, what'd you find out? He entered the temple. I ache with sadness to tell you. But... How about the French officials? Would they help? They are most cautious. To them, sorcery as well as religion retains a dignity. They do not interfere. Yeah. Captain Carney, I fear that any warning I might give you would be heard only by your ears. Yeah, I'm afraid that's right. My mind is ready to receive the message of the Upsari Seas. Thanks for the warning anyway, Ling. It wasn't long, maybe 20 minutes after Ling Ti Chen left, that the chanting stopped. 
I moved up through the crowd to catch any cues that were thrown to the chosen who were to be allowed entrance into the temple of Apsaraces. The first move was easy. The massive door swung open on an interior dimly lit by more flickering flame. I followed the seven or eight natives who moved forward in response to the appeals and gestures of the women. Two of the natives were turned back after brief questioning that I didn't understand. When the hostesses saw me, I caught the quick glances that snapped between them. One of them stopped me just outside the door. What do you want? I want to go in the temple. You not belong here. You go. I belong here, all right. I don't want to go in. You belong Baria? No. What do you want? I want the other man like me. He came in before. You no know, I want to find him. I go in if I have to burn the temple down. You no belong here. You want come, you come. You no belong here. The look she gave me was entirely different from the sultry looks the natives were getting. The big doors swung shut as we entered a narrow hallway. It was bathed in an orange glow from the flames, permeated by incense smoke that swirled up from the fire urns. And the fascinated expressions of the men, there must have been great promise in the words from the woman who spoke. We followed them eagerly across the hallway. The door was open, and silently we obeyed their gestures and entered the room beyond. The door clicked shut. But the women stayed outside. I didn't know whether the others heard it or not, but I did. A bar slid quietly across the door, locking us in. This room, too, was lighted by a pair of fire urns, but the odor here was different. Still incense, but mixed with it a thickly sweet smell that tingled a little in the nostrils. Made itself felt deeper in the throat. It was so subtle that I hardly noticed what was happening. It was almost pleasant. So that when I did realize, I couldn't make myself care enough to fight it. Or to worry about it. Or to worry about Stan Mathias. Or to even wish that I was someplace else. I lay down on the floor with my fellow dreamers. Staring at the ceiling. Smiling. Breathing deeply until I couldn't see the ceiling anymore. And then I floated away. Floated away. Even the hangover from it wasn't bad until I remembered what I'd come for and became aware of what was going on in the room. There was no longer any feminine promise about it. Two squat, powerful natives wearing razor-sharp creases in their sashes were in the room. They'd opened a trap door on the floor. Through it, I could hear water. They were herding the still-weak natives through it and into a boat that waited below. When the last of them had been sent down, the trap slammed shut. The guards moved toward me. You get up. You come. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Go. Door. Where to? Where are we going? You go. Princess Negor. Who's Princess Negor? She high priestess. His temple. She high Zaras. All right. Go. 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 The high priestess, Princess Nagor, made a beautiful picture surrounded by the mysticism, the color, the sense of the temple of the Apsaraces. She lounged languidly on a raised couch. Her costume was in the tradition of early Theta Barry. Her face was beautiful, her mouth stained scarlet, her eyebrows penciled darkly. There was only one thing wrong with the picture. She wasn't native. Her coloring was airy and fair, and she smiled at the surprise I was showing. The Princess Nagor bid you welcome. Thanks. The mortal seems surprised at the appearance of the High Priestess, direct descendant of Brakhan himself. I'm getting over it. I'm glad. You must have something to talk about since you entered the temple with the rest of my slaves. Yeah, that's right. Stanley Matthias, I came after him. You won't get him. Captain Carney, he's my own special slave. Maybe if you get down off that throne, we can talk sense, huh? And he's deeply in love with me. You'll see that yourself. What's the deal, princess? You want money? 
You want me to pay ransom for him? You insult me, Captain. My income is more than sufficient. I want him near me, and he's quite willing to remain. This is a little thick after the rest of your act. I saw Stan at six this evening, and he was quite willing to be leaving this hole in the morning. Now, what do you want? Shall I make an offer? I want nothing. His life is a lonely one. I saw Stanley on the streets one day. He's handsome and fair and young. I saw to it that I met him. He came to say goodbye tonight and tell me he was sailing with you. But he changed his mind. Now he's here. He will stay here. And live this fake of yours? He's not crazy. Call it fake if you like. Only you miss the fact that it's quite profitable. The six natives who came in with you will bring 40 francs apiece. My turnover each night is between 30 and 50. You look puzzled, Captain. Yeah. Labor in the interior, Captain. A ready market in the mines and the plantations and the gardens of the mandarins. Under the uh, sedative you received, they all signed three-year contracts. I'll keep my mouth shut about what I think of that, Princess. All I want out of here is Stan. Prisons are tough on the equator. I don't think he'd do so well sharing that with you. Captain, I don't want to argue with you. Why don't you talk to Stan? Maybe you remember that's why I came. I really don't know why I bother, except that I like to make righteous men like you swallow their words. I'll have him come in, but in case you have any rash ideas, please remember the gods. I'll try to remember them, Princess. I'll try to. <laughs> I was almost surprised to see him walk into the room, his husky body erect, his blonde hair neatly combed, his white suit unwrinkled. I don't know what I'd expected, marks of a struggle, I suppose. He crossed directly to her and stood in front of her. Here's Captain Carney Stan. He's come to take you away from me. Do you want to go? He turned slowly from her and faced me. His eyes looked at me, but still through me. The rest of his expression was normal, a half-smile on his friendly mouth, but there was nothing I knew in his eyes or behind them. Do you want to go? No. I'm staying. Well, Captain... Stan, your father's waiting on the ship. We're going to leave for North Borneo in the morning. No. Captain Carney doesn't believe that we mean so much to one another. Nagor has been lonely here, and now I've found her, and I know I've been lonely, too. I've heard enough. He's not making sense. Tell me, Captain, what is sense? He's left your world and entered mine, so you don't think it's sense. He'll be happier here than he's ever been before. Yeah, how long does he live in that condition? But you, you're a new high, Princess. You're the filthiest hunk of humanity I've ever met. Captain, don't anger we'll me. We'll talk that over later. Right now, you're going to help me get out of here. God, Get out of the way, Stan. No, don't touch her. Please. I figured that if I had her in my arms as a shield, I could keep the blades of the guards away from you. But Stan, half crazed, half conscious, and still following her will, blocked me away from her. I tried to sidestep him just as the guards got to me. Sword hilt hit the back of my head and staggered me forward. Two pairs of arms took me up, pushing forward on my elbows and back on my wrists. The pain streaked to my shoulders and I stopped struggling. How long, up on you know? Yeah. I've warned the guards I want no blood here, but out of no kindness to you. That's fine. I'd be ashamed to accept it. You realize, of course, Captain, that since you bothered to come here, you're a great menace to me and my temple. I'd be a foolish priestess to allow you to escape. Yeah, but you're close to the end. There'll be a whole crew coming if I don't get back. I've arranged for a boat that will arrive for you soon. So bear in mind the next time you fall asleep in your aromatic little chamber that the punishment for those that defile my temple is a watery one and the offender well-weighted. You're still a new high, princess. And I still will be when you're resting at the bottom of the harbor. Bondo, take... <coughs> Come. <coughs> My only advantage over the last time the door closed on me was that at least I knew what was in the room with me and I knew where it came from. As soon as the guards were out of hearing, I knocked the fire urns off of their pedestals. I stomped the charcoal embers that burned under the drug, holding a handkerchief over my nose. The smoke didn't lessen any. The activity increased my breathing. I tried to smother them with my sweat-soaked jumper. That didn't work either. But while I was near the floor, I learned that the fumes were heavy and stronger down there. I climbed up on the pedestals, groping in the darkness, staggering as the stuff took hold. But I found fresher air up there and cleared my wandering mind with it. 
I tried the sloping ceiling for weakness. Found none. Filling my lungs, I went to the floor again. Groped for the trap door. It was solid and immovable. I found a heavy base of one of the urns. Climbed back on the pedestals to hold out as long as I could. The clean air held for a while, but wondering when the strength of the fumes would climb to me made each breath I took an adventure. The relaxation set in. And my dreams were of a canted deck, swept by cool spray and clean, fresh air. And I... I shook my head to bring myself back, and shaking it, I wasn't sure whether the sound I heard was real or not. I gritted my teeth to stay with it and heard it again. A movement outside the door. I got to the floor by the time the bar rattled the first time. It staggered across the room by the time it slid free. It was waiting when the door opened and the first guard, a ragged his nose, walked slowly into the unexpected darkness. When he was in position, I crashed the heavy pedestal base down on his head. I grabbed him as he slumped. The other guard, blade held chest high, rushed. I lifted the body to take the thrust. I left him hanging there, stepped around him, and caught the other guard with my weapon before he could recover his stance. I barred the door on him. I went into the high priestess's chamber. What is this? What's happened? Come on, Stan. Snap out of it. Let's go. No, you can't. He's going to stay. Where am I going? Come on, Stan. He's going to take you away from me. Stan, don't let him. Fight, Stan. Fight so you can stay with me. Get away from her. Get away from her. Fight. Get away from her. I thought he'd be a pushover in the dream he was living, but I was wrong. I couldn't hurt him. He didn't land many, but those he did were solid with power. I dropped his head as a target and shot for his throat. He was like dead flesh. He didn't feel anything, and my own weakness was coming back to me. I put one into his solar plexus that rocked him. I put another one in, and another one. Finally. Then I looked at the princess. She was gone. I unlocked the door that I'd barred on the guards, then I went to the big fire urns in the entrance hall, tilted them so that the flames licked up the walls. Bent down, threw a stand over my shoulder, and left. I only stopped to look back once, down toward the other end of Bejraburi Street. Healthy flames were licking up through the roof of the Temple of the Apsparaises. And excited crowds were running toward it. Then I went back to the ship. Well, I hope we haven't delayed you too long, Captain. It's long after your planned dawn departure. No, no, we got plenty of time, Mr. Mathias. But I did want to see you. The doctor sent Stan up to a hospital in Saigon, and he was almost back to normal before he left. He um, says he hopes you understand, Captain. <laughs> if anybody does, I do. Mm. I got a whiff of that stuff myself. He, he doesn't remember a minute of it. Oh? Uh-huh. Mm. Well, you tell him for me he's lucky. And that the French officials got his girl. She started life as plain Hortense Croft in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's quite a descent from that to... High Priestess of Berea. Huh? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, too, Mr. Uh, Sainz. Yeah. That it happened and that you can't make the crossing with it. Uh, Captain, one is so <laughs> uh, limited in Berea, but uh, I'd like you to have this. Hmm? Well, splashes. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, of course, anything I'd say in thanks would be completely uh, insufficient. But, Captain, if you ever get to Nevada, we'll try in some way to repay you. Well, thanks. I'm in uh, mining, you know, just outside Ely. And if you ever get sick of this life and want to settle down, just let me know. My my hand on it, Captain, I promise you a position. I'll keep that in mind, Mr. Matthias. I'll keep that in mind. Half hour later, we put the low coastline of French Indochina on our stern and started to trap the breeze that pushed its jungle smells to us. It was a long leg ahead of us to Port Moresby. 
and the crewmen looking forward to the even flow of sea life snap to their stations at Red's command. mainsail uncurled in the morning sun, shook itself restlessly, and went caught as it bent into the wind. The jib snapped out. The mizzen swung into place. The lee rail settled down toward the churning water, and the Scarlet Queen took the bone in her teeth and fought the swells that rose up before her. Ah, she's a great ship, Skipper. She likes her work. Yeah, she'll do for me. Yeah, but what are you going to do with her in Nevada, Skipper? I hear they got a desert there. Oh, well, that's when I get sick of this life, remember? <laughs> I don't know, Skipper. He's probably got a good, soft desk job for you and a wealthy daughter for you to marry. Well, is that bad? Then I could subscribe to yachting magazines. No. No yachts in Nevada. <laughs> but you could do your traveling in a deck chair on one of those big ocean liners. Oh, stop it, Red. You're making me seasick. <laughs> Well, but he did hit one vital spot. Yeah. The bottle he gave us. Better try it, huh? Yeah. He's got a heart. <laughs> and a sadder but wiser son. But we got a ship. Here, Skipper. To the Queen. To the Scarlet Queen. After you, mate. After you. Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Wind brisk, sky fair, mainsail and mizzen reefed, ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, master. will invite you to sail into further adventure on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen next week at the same time. Porto Call, Rabaul, New Britain. of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher and tonight featured Gloria Blondell as the princess with John Daner and Ben Wright. Music scored and conducted by Richard Arant. The Scarlet Queen produced by James Burton is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. The school system of our country is in the midst of a very real and very dangerous crisis. There are two million children of school age who should be in school, but are unable to attend because of the lack of facilities. Look into the school conditions in your own hometown. They may need your aid. This program came to you from Hollywood. Stay tuned now for another mutual favorite, Quiet Please, which follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.